While most of an organization's resources should be devoted to preventing any data incidents or data breaches, bad things happen and organizations need to make sure they're ready to deal with them when they arise. Being able to respond quickly and competently will have a huge effect on managing the incident. I've worked with many, many companies, both large and small, in responding to suspected and actual data breaches. I've seen organizations that are well-equipped to manage them and others that are forced to make it all up on the spot. The former are always happy that they prepared and the latter always wish they had been. Today, I'll be talking about what an organization should already have in place in the event that the bad things happen. Hi, my name is David Fraser. I'm a privacy internet and technology lawyer with the Canadian law firm McGinnis Cooper. I also teach internet and media law at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. In this channel, I try to provide educational and informative content about Canadian privacy and technology law. You should check out the full disclaimer below, but you should know that I'm about to give you a very high level overview of a pretty complicated and nuanced subject. Organizations vary in size, structure, and complexity. If you're dealing with any of these issues yourself, you should get experienced legal advice right away. And any opinions expressed are mine alone and should not be attributed to my firm or any of its clients. Every organization should have a plan and a process to address all privacy incidents, from identifying them, reporting them, escalating them, managing them, and resolving them. A suspected security or privacy incident is a process, and the stronger the process, the better it can be managed. You need to have a plan that makes sure you are prepared to deal with all aspects of the data incident. You need to be able to identify any incident and then manage it appropriately. That includes containment and elimination of the problem. The first step is making sure that your organization has a way of identifying and escalating any suspected privacy or security incidents. Every employee should know how to identify if something is wrong or just seems wrong. They should be trained to discern the severity of the incident, but they should also know that every suspected incident needs to be reported to someone who is responsible for its assessment. The training and policy should clearly let employees know that this is a priority. They need to stop what they are doing and address the actual or suspected incident immediately. They should know exactly who to call and where to report it. Here are some important lessons I've learned along the way. A lot of incidents are caused by individual mistakes and often the incident is only known to the person who makes the mistake. It may be human nature for the person to try to minimize it or even cover it up to preserve their own hide. An organization really needs to make an effort to create a culture in which mistakes are reported. Mistakes happen. The focus should be on reporting the issue and managing the issue and not finger pointing. There may be consequences later on, but keep in mind that the threat of discipline may undermine incident reporting and management. Other than instant decisions that can be made to isolate or immediately stop the progress of bad things, all decisions should be made in consultation with someone more senior in the organization. Without getting into all the details, I've seen decisions made by individuals in the first hours of an incident that have had cascading bad effects later on. Two heads, at the least, are better than one. And big decisions should be made in consultation with the team, which I'll describe in a bit. All incidents, large and small, should be escalated to one person or one group of people who have the knowledge and skill to assess its severity and impact. Years ago, there was a problem in one of Canada's major banks. Individual branches were having what seemed like relatively small, manageable incidents. They were all handled at the branch level, with reporting them to a central office. So senior management wasn't aware of it until media reporting brought it to the attention of everyone, including senior management. There was a process-related issue that affected almost all of the bank's branches. It could have been readily addressed if, if at the first few times it arose, it had been reported to the privacy office. They would have recognized the commonality, found the root source, and fixed it. But because it was managed in the branch without escalation, the privacy office had no idea it was happening until the cumulative effect resulted in media attention. Make sure that all incidents are promptly reported to the same place for review and analysis. This need is even more acute now in Canada since all privacy incidents have to be documented. So even if it happens in the branch, it needs to be documented centrally. So what does an incident response team do and what does it look like? The goal of your team is to assess, document, and respond to incidents, restore your systems, recover information, and reduce the risk of the incident reoccurring. Someone needs to be the overall leader of the group, coordinating the different cross-functional areas. 
There needs to be an operational leader who is focused on containment, investigation, and remediation. And then there needs to be relevant subject matter experts. Of course, the privacy lead needs to be there. They should be the most familiar with the organization's incident plan and its information holdings. They should be the one who does the initial risk assessment and convenes the right team that's appropriate for the scale of the incident. And even before the team is assembled, they have likely made inquiries or have given directions regarding immediate containment and mitigation of the breach. It's likely a no-brainer that you want your IT leadership at the table if the incident is related to your information systems. The reality is that if the incident is of any significance, you will definitely want an independent external IT consultant with their team at the table. The incident may have been caused by lax practices that occurred under your existing IT leadership, and they can't be objective in assessing what went wrong and what has to be done immediately. The IT leaders do need to be there, though, as nobody else has the same familiarity with your systems. The right external IT consultants will have dealt with hundreds of similar incidents. They know the drill. They know the root causes. They sometimes even know the adversary and can offer some of the best informed expertise to manage and mitigate the incident. For a significant incident, the team needs to include all hands on deck from a management point of view. You'll want your communications and marketing people represented because of their expertise in communications and their ability to get messaging out quickly if necessary. They also may, may be the closest to your customers or other stakeholders, and managing those relationships in a crisis is important. You will definitely need your risk management and insurance folks represented at the table. Insurance may be absolutely key in this process, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. This may sound self-serving, but you will definitely want outside legal counsel at the table. You may actually want outside legal counsel to essentially chair the group. I've spoken about this before, but in a nutshell, any privacy incident has a significant legal component. This group will be considering the following questions, all of which are essentially legal questions. Did we meet our legal obligations in avoiding this incident? What is our legal risk in connection with this incident? Will we be sued? If so, what is our exposure? How can we manage or mitigate that exposure? Are we insured for the costs? Do we have to notify regulators and individuals? Unless these questions are directed to a lawyer, they will not be protected by privilege and only lawyers can give legal advice. If records are made for the purpose of obtaining legal advice or to prepare for reasonably anticipated litigation, those records will be privileged. Depending on the scale of the incident or the nature of the incident, you want human resources to either be available to the incident response team or you'll want them directly at the table. So I've mentioned insurance a couple times. Any incident plan should include a summary of all the insurance that an organization may have, what the limits are and what the deductibles are. It should also have the contact information for your insurance broker and all the ways that your insurer wants an incident like this reported. Your cybersecurity or other privacy related insurance likely requires you to report the incident to the insurer or broker as soon as possible. It may well be that they'll swoop in and replace your lawyer and forensic team with the team that they've chosen. Yep, that's the way it often works as a condition of your insurance. While few incidents will require the CEO of a large organization at the table, they should be on call and they should be kept up to speed. There can be necessary decisions that can only be made at that level and depending on the nature of the organization, the board of directors may need to be apprised of the situation and updated regularly. For example, the decision of whether to make a ransomware payment should only be made by the CEO and that with the advice of the breach response team. Who needs to be at the table depends on the nature of the incident, but the privacy lead should have 24-7 contact information for everyone, and everyone should know what's expected of them. Escalating reporting is absolutely key, and everyone needs to know where to report things. But sometimes an incident can itself cause communications failures. We are increasingly dependent on complicated IT systems that may have a lot of parts, but can have a single point of failure. For example, if your dom domain controller or authentication server is out of commission, your employees and your management team may not be able to use any of your mission critical systems. That can cut off access to email, instant messaging systems, voice over IP phone systems. Your plan should anticipate something like this happening and make sure that there are independent backups for just about every system that will be important in the event of an incident. I've personally seen a situation where the incident plan was kept on the company's intranet, which was unavailable during the entire incident. 
I've seen incidents where all company email accounts were unavailable, so the incident had to be managed using personal email accounts. Any plan should anticipate this and should put in place alternative collaboration tools. You must have a plan. Whether you follow that plan to the letter will depend on a bunch of factors, but the process of creating a plan and thinking all of this through will put you and your organization in a much better position. There's no shortage of conventional wisdom out there about planning. For example, there's a quote from military history that says, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Now, boxing has a similar adage, variously attributed to Mike Tyson, quote, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, unquote. I actually like this one from President Eisenhower, quote, plans are worthless, but planning is everything, unquote. When it comes to a data incident, planning is truly everything. So what does a plan look like? It will include many of the things I've just discussed. It includes policies and procedures for recognizing an incident and escalating it to the right people. It will include information about the team that needs to be involved, who gets notified, how to contact them, who makes decisions, and where does the buck stop. The first part of your plan addresses preparation. Setting aside security infrastructure and processes for the moment, the key part of preparation from a privacy point of view is training for all personnel on how to identify an incident and how they need to react. As I said earlier, if an incident is identified, everyone needs to know how to address it immediately and who to report it to. Everyone in the organization needs to know this, and the preparation part of the plan is how this is carried out. The members of the response team need to know their roles and should have practiced this. Preparation should include actual drills throughout the organization and tabletop exercises with the incident response team. In my experience, tabletop exercises are invaluable as you will quickly determine the strengths and weaknesses of your plan and your team. Was there someone there who didn't need to be there? Was there a necessary skill set that was not represented? Could the team reach consensus and work together collaboratively? You would really rather find this out in a low stakes exercise than in the middle of an incident. The second part of the plan addresses identification. Not only do you need to know that there is an incident, but you need to understand its scope and its source. This will be a process from the first time an incident becomes known all the way through to a root cause analysis. Best case scenario, it's a suspected incident, but all is good. But you don't know that until someone who knows what they're doing really looks into it. The incident manager will need to know, is it an actual privacy or security incident? How did it happen? How was it discovered? Who discovered it? Have any other areas been impacted? What's the scope of the incident? What data was affected? Does it affect operations? Has the source or point of entry been determined? You'll of course need the right people with the right skills to dig into this. And if you've worked on incidents before, you'll recognize that some of this information needs to be accurately reported to the privacy commissioner if the incident meets the reporting thresholds. The third part of the plan is managing the incident itself. This includes containment, eradication, and recovery. What this all looks like will vary greatly depending upon whether you're dealing with a complete human error, technical failure, or intrusion. Containment means containing the breach so it is stopped in its tracks, or at least it doesn't spread and cause further damage to the business. This can include disconnecting and isolating affected devices from your internal network or even from the internet. Have short-term and long-term containment strategies ready. It's also good to have a redundant system backup to help restore business operations. This stage also includes damage control. If the incident is a lost device containing personal information, can it be remotely wiped? If it was misdirected data, can the unauthorized recipient be contacted to assess with confidence whether the data went any further? The incident manager at this stage will need to know what has been done to contain the incident for the short term. What's been done to contain the incident for the long term? Is quarantining of software or hardware necessary to protect the rest of the systems? What sort of backups are in place? Have all access credentials been reviewed for legitimacy, hardened, and changed? Have you applied all recent security patches and updates? Eradication is the process of ensuring that you have found and eliminated the cause of the incident. If malware is involved, this means all malware should be securely removed, systems should again be hardened and patched, and updates should be applied. All systems, including apparently unaffected ones, should be examined for the possible existence of this root source and appropriately, and appropriately addressed. This needs to be done promptly. Recovery, as you might think, is getting everything back up and running with confidence that the incident will not recur. At this stage, the incident manager will need to know, when can systems be back up and fully running? 
Have systems been patched, hardened, and tested? Can any lost data be restored from a trusted backup? What tools can we deploy to ensure similar incidents will not reoccur? Legal compliance and risk management is, as the name suggests, ensuring that all regulatory and legal compliance steps have been taken in connection with the incident, and that steps are taken to reduce the organization's risk of liability. In this day and age, all incidents involving personal information need to be carefully reviewed by legal counsel to ensure that appropriate steps are taken for an organization to meet its legal and regulatory obligations. Legal counsel will need to know what was the nature of the data at issue. This will need to get into the details of all the data fields since reporting and notice obligations in some non-Canadian jurisdictions are triggered by certain criteria, such as account numbers, identification document numbers, and the like. Legal counsel will need to determine what laws could possibly apply to the data. In broad terms, privacy laws are like consumer protection laws and are understood to apply to information about the residents of a particular jurisdiction, regardless of where the data goes. Some statutes expressly say that the particular law applies to the data of residents of that jurisdiction. If the data of residents from other places in, is involved, you'll likely need to engage counsel from those places to advise on local reporting and notification requirements. For Canada, legal counsel will need to do a documented assessment of whether the incident creates a real risk of significant harm to the affected individuals. Reporting to regulators and notice to affected individuals may be legally required. Legal counsel will need to have all the necessary facts to make those reports and to assist with the preparation of notices. Legal risk mitigation steps can be put in place as well. For example, if the incident creates any risk of identity theft or identity fraud, the organization would be well advised to offer credit protection and insurance to affected individuals. This is available at a reasonable cost and can go a long way to mitigate harm and reduce the likelihood of an award of damages in a subsequent lawsuit. Dealing with the legal and communications fallout will likely endure for a long, long time if the incident is significant. The last part of the plan is making sure that the organization learns from the incident. Once the investigation is complete, there should be a meeting including all members of the relevant incident response team to discuss what you've learned from the incident. This is where you will analyze and document everything about the incident to determine what worked well in your plan and where there were some holes. Are there training opportunities that will make the process even better or reduce the likelihood of a future similar incident? If you had an external forensic team in as part of your incident response, it's very, very likely, likely that they uncovered other vulnerabilities or issues with your systems that were not directly related to this incident, but will also need to be addressed. These should be discussed, prioritized, and their recommendations should be followed. So that's what your incident planning should look like, obviously at a relatively high level. I hope this has been interesting and useful. I try to put out a new video every week or so, so if you're interested in this sort of content, please click the like and subscribe buttons. Also leave a comment if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions for other topics to cover. And of course, feel free to share this with anyone who you think may be interested in hearing about Canadian tech and privacy law. Thanks for tuning in.